We are in Luke once again. I think the last time we actually gathered was... <laughs> before in, Hanukkah? Yeah, before Hanukkah, which is before Christmas and so forth. December 4th, I think, was the last you know, evening Sabbath that we were together. In terms of, I mean, as yeah. far as study. In terms of this. <laughs> yeah, in a study. Yeah, yeah. In a, together in a study, so it's been a bit... Yeah. And no. I, as I recall, I did not, uh, I did not mark my notes in terms of where we left off, but I did go back and listen to the last video, you know, so I'm going to say that we are at Luke chapter 22, verses 63 through 71. In other words, right. yeah, yeah, we're going to finish up Luke 22 okay. and, uh, and what? I understood that there would only be two or three or four or whatever of us tonight. Sorry. But I mulled over it for a long time and really thought that we should go ahead and be together. So I will read those lines and ask if you have a comment. Meanwhile, the men who were holding Yeshua made fun of him. They beat him blindfolded him and kept asking him, Now, prophesy, who hit you that time? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the people's council of elders, including both the head Kohanim, the head priest, and Torah teachers, met and led him off to the Sanhedrin, where they said, If you are the Mashiach, if you are the Messiah, tell us. He answered, If I tell you, you won't believe me. And if I ask you, you won't answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be, and he quotes, quotes Psalm 110, verse 1, very popular psalm. And he said, But from now on, the Son of Man will be sitting at the right hand of Hagivarah, of, of the greatness. They all said, does this mean then that you are the Son of God? And he answered them, you say I am. They said, why do we need additional testimony? We have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Okay, pretty well-known passage. So what comes to mind when, when we read these verses as far as your minds go and your hearts? Well, let me read it. <laughs> well, I was just reading it to you, but we were we were dealing with dog's fifth. Uh -huh. Now, in the meantime, I'll take a drink. I. Uh, I have referred to this as projecting blasphemy, projecting quote unquote blasphemy. So I'll go ahead with a, a note. Sure. The three very basic meanings of the Greek word chi are and, also, and even. It's a matter of continuance. So Dr. Stern has meanwhile, blah, blah, blah. That is, while Pete was being exposed, just before this we find Simon Peter, Shimon, Kepha, basically being exposed. He's, he now, everybody now knows who he is. And, but while this is going, you know, in the meantime, while Pete is being exposed, guards were uh, ridiculing, making fun of Yeshua. They were blaspheming him. Beating him, they blindfolded him, asking, Now, prophesy who hit you. This is reported as blasphemy. We read it there, and indeed it is. The Hebrew word for such is helul, meaning blasphemy, profanation, or desecration. Stomping somebody down. It is the Greek word blasphemeo that we have borrowed into the English language. Almost all times throughout Scripture, blasphemy is, is against yod heh vav -Heh himself. Almost each and every time. Hence, when looking up such a matter in modern Ivrit, in modern Hebrew, 
One finds blasphemy as Helu Hashem, or desecration of the Lord. Again, this is, quote, the hour when darkness rules. When the Sanhedrin, you know, the chief priest, when the Sanhedrin pushes Yeshua to admit that he is the Mashiach, the Christos, he tells them, as he knows so very well, that, they, that it really doesn't matter how he answers. It really doesn't matter how he answers. He could say peekaboo, and it would be taken as bad. He insults us. Yes. So, so what Yeshua does say is a quote from Psalm 110, verse 1, which all admit is about the Messiah. Judaism and Christianity will tell you Psalm, 1, Psalm 110 is about the Messiah. When asked specifically about being the Son of God, Yeshua says something very much like, You said it. And with all such blaspheming ways from the Sanhedrin, they finally determine that Yeshua has himself committed quote-unquote blasphemy by saying, you said it. Why would any additional testimony be needed, right? Because we heard him basically say, yeah, I'm God, and you can't say you're God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we call this, I have commonly for years called this particular court proceeding a kangaroo court. Not everybody was even there, you know, but uh, call it a kangaroo court because it didn't really go through, you know, all the stuff that you should, you mean, we, we know he's guilty. Pardon? Yeah, they were hopping mad. <laughs> yeah. Being a kangaroo court. <laughs> they were just, yeah, hopping mad. They just, they just wanted to hear anything that they could construe to be Blasphemy, and of course, well, blasphemy means we must surely put him to death. Yep. So, the point that the spirit of Adonai is leading to here is this. The tie or link with Kepha being exposed as bad, simply because he was following Yeshua, giving up everything for him, and the acts against Yeshua himself all tie together. That's why the Greek word chi is there. It's linking these two things together. That's what chi means. It's a link. To go against the Jewish Messiah, indeed, the most Jewish man who ever lived, is the most anti-Semitic thing one can do. However, just as all of Avraham's seed is tied in together, all the more are followers of this Jewish Messiah. We're all tied in with him and he with us. I am not naive enough or silly enough to even suggest that any and all followers of the Messiah are Jewish, for how many believers even know what that word even actually means. Yet when folks are solidly against Yeshua the Messiah, even though they may not realize how much they are against him, they will sooner or later also show their strong dis distancing from you. Allow me to say, as someone who has experienced this in a very real way, do not draw back from this Jewish man called Hamashiach, called the Christ, the Messiah. Rather be strengthened in him. Hear the words repeated many times to Yehoshua, Joshua, who was later called Yeshua. In the Chronicles, he is called Yeshua. Repeated to him is, be strong, be bold, and don't be afraid or downhearted because Adonai your God is with you wherever you go. End of quote. Understand that the word with and the word people are spelled the exact same way. The word with is spelled ayin meim. People is spelled ayin meim. So he's actually saying God people you and I are part and parcel of God's people if we are with him and he with us. You can't get any more strength than that. You can't get any more, you know, borrowed boldness from, than that to be part and parcel with him. So as you have done it unto the least of these, my people, you have done it to me. That's what he means. If you are linked with him, then if somebody does something to you, you're doing it to him because with, that's what with means. You link together. My arm is with me. It's good. It would be really bad if it was with someone else. Right. 
So I hope you get it. We're called the body of, so that means as they have done it unto you, they've done it unto me. So the, that phrase echoing Genesis 12, verse 2 through 3, is certainly about Avraham's seed, quote unquote. Added to that seed are countless others who, though without clear understanding of what it means, are grafted into the olive tree of Israel. Be strong, be bold, for Yode Vave is with you. Work together, defend each other, and allow his strength to be made known. Being strong and being bold is the opposite of being cowardly and intimidated. Any thoughts? The video stopped. Can you go hit that button again? Mm. Here it is. I don't know why it stopped, but it stopped. Oh. Okay. Well, I'll say it I have again. To, have to check every once in a while, I guess. Yeah. Going again. I'm going to read it again then. Hope you all don't mind. <clears throat> so the point that the Spirit of Adonai is saying is to, leading to here is this, to, to tie your link with, the, the, the tie your link with Kepha, with Peter, with Cephas, being exposed as bad simply because he's following Yeshua, giving up everything for him and the acts against Yeshua himself all tie together. To go against the Jewish Messiah, indeed the most Jewish man who ever lived, is the most anti-Semitic thing one can do. However, just as all of Avraham's seed is tied in together, all the more are followers of this Jewish Messiah tied in together. I'm not naive enough or silly enough to even suggest that any and all followers of the Messiah are Jewish. For many, how many believers even know what that word actually means? Yet when folks are solidly against Yeshua the Messiah, even though they may not realize how much they are against him, they will sooner or later show their strong distancing from you. Allow me to say, as someone who has experienced this in a very real way, do not draw back from this Jewish man called Hamashiach, or the Messiah. Rather, be strengthened in him. Here are the words repeated many times to Yehoshua, Joshua, who was later called Yeshua in the Chronicles. Be strong, be bold, and... Don't be afraid or downhearted because Adonai, your God, is with you wherever you go. Understand the word with and the word people are spelled the exact same way, I and maim. With is I and maim, people are I and maim. You and I are, are part and parcel of God's people if we are with him and he with us. That's why we're called the body of Christ, the body of Messiah. As you quote, as you have done it unto the least of these, my people, you've done it unto me. That's why he says it that way. Because if you're with him, you're connected, you're part of him. That phrase echoing Genesis 12, 2 through 3, is certainly about Avraham's seed. Added to that seed are countless others, who, though without clear understanding of what it means, are grafted into the olive tree of Israel. So be strong. Be bold, for Adonai is with you. Work together, defend each other, and allow this strength to be, to be known. Being strong and being bold is the opposite of being cowardly and intimidated. So, again, if you have any thoughts concerning that, you're free to voice those thoughts. <clears throat> One of the, about this general passage, um, I'll just, we have a picture here, and I was trying to figure out how to share the picture to Rebecca for Facebook or anything. Mm -hmm. We've all heard about the Sanhedrin court. Right. And this little study Bible has a picture of it, and it, it, it was held in the so-called Chamber of Hewn Stone, which was right outside, or it was inside Herod's Temple, mm -hmm. kind of in the southwest corner. So when you come in the front into the courtyard, if you hung immediate left and headed to, there were, there were, there was a series of rooms. 
and the very first one you would find on your left was the court, uh, the chamber, mm -hmm. where the council meetings were held. Right. And this shows a reconstruction image, kind of CGI, and then it gives a little description. The Jewish High Court of Justice consisted of 71 men right. and was led by the high priest. Mm -hmm. The council could decide almost any fate of its people except the death penalty, which was decided by the Romans. The court was located within the chamber of hewn stone inside Herod's temple. So, you have 71 men on this high court headed by the high priest. Um, these were the most powerful Jews mm -hmm. in Israel under Roman rule. Mm -hmm. Those were the Sadducees. The they were predominantly maybe 100% Sadducees, I guess, mm -hmm. led by a high priest whose position had been bought and sold mm -hmm. by money, not, mm -hmm. not adhering to God's instructions. Part and parcel of the Hanukkah story. Yes. By not the high priest. For, for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. Jack. <laughs> and so it's ironic that just a few yards away you have the Holy of Holies. You have this structure, this building that is supposed to house or, or be a place where the Most High God uh, comes and resides in the midst of his people. Mm -hmm. And you've got these frauds in a room just off to the side, past trying to pass judgment, claiming to pass judgment on God himself, mm -hmm. on the Son of God. And they're, they're toying with him. They think they're in the position of strength and power. And they think they're judging Jesus from their perspective they are. And yet, um, Jesus himself is holding back because this is all part of the process. Mm -hmm that was planned out long ahead of time. Um, and it's it's interesting that this passage starts with, to me, it starts with, uh, you know, the people who were holding him, imprisoning him, they blindfolded him, and then they were hitting him, and then saying, hey, you know, prophesy, tell us who was it to hit you if you're, you know, really who you claim to be. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not a comment on whether he could or couldn't have done that. That's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, he couldn't see with his own eyes, but they couldn't see with their own eyes what was right in front of their face, and neither could the high court. These people who were pretending to be the high priest and the, the leaders, the rulers uh, under the Romans of all of Israel. It's just so backwards mm -hmm. and insulting. Yeah. In fact, it's insulting to the original purpose of a court. Yeah. The, and Dennis Prager made a, made a good point of this uh, within this week. I want to say it's like Monday or something, but pointing out that, okay, it says in, in, back in Torah, the court is called the elders. Just another way of saying a court. Court of elders. So it says that if uh, somebody, you know, is having trouble with their child to the point that they just want to kill him, no. A parent cannot kill a child. They have to take him to the, to the elders, the court. Well, he points out that the ingenious about that, about the court, is what parent, in their right mind, after just being so frustrated they want to kill their kid, is actually going to, you know, by the time they get into the court, they're going to say, what are we doing? You know, and the, it, and the, 
it is not the parents who have the right to kill their child. It doesn't matter what the child does. It's only the court. And the court is probably not going to say, you know, yeah, kill this child. They, they, don't, they may or may not even notice. Job of the doctors. <laughs> Job of the doctors. But, but the, you know, but the court is actually to stop people from doing things that are just simply wrong. They don't, things that are not following the, the evidence or fruit of the Spirit of the Lord. So, you know, it's, it's actually a rather ingenious thing of our Lord to set up a court system. And as we pointed out, it's not when you read about the court system in, in Exodus chapter 23, you don't, it does not say command this. It says lay this before them so that, you know, we all would, it's, it's another way of saying don't be caught in court. Don't do that. Don't go to that place because the court is not there to make themselves God. You hope that you never go there. So for a court to be so Hellenized, so taken over by Greco-Roman thought and be purchased, that they think that they are in control, complete control, to listen to a fellow utter the words, you said it, and thus he is guilty of the thing that they've been doing for the last several minutes, projecting blasphemy onto him is simply not following Torah. It's not following the ways of Exodus 23 through 25. So yes, uh, even today, court systems can get a little bit mixed up thinking that it's a matter of power rather than, uh, you know, allowing or causing people to be able to come to the right senses and work it out themselves. Or I thought I would say what you're saying in Iran kind of way. <laughs> I talk a lot more. Any other thoughts concerning this passage? All right. Heading into chapter 23 of Luke. Sertel. I'm not going to go through all the precedings. <laughs> of, could I ask you and all that? Read. <laughs> Just. <laughs> Luke 23, 1 through 7, if you would. And I thank you for that. <laughs> Don't thank me yet. <laughs> well, it was up and now it decided to uh, not be up. Not be up anymore. So that's annoying. Is it updating to the latest translation? I hope not. <laughs> of King James? Yeah. It's like, oh, we have King James Version 1.2 now. Yeah. That's right here. 23. 1, 1 through, through 7. 1 through 7. Yes. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. <laughs> then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. Okay. Thoughts of your own? Well, yeah, it's like Brian was saying a bit ago, you know, the, the whole plan here is to actually die for, you know, the most outstanding reason. But, so he's going to, you know, and especially when things are in court and it's about you, you keep your mouth shut, right? Well, I, mean, I, I was thinking about Pilate. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. Too. It didn't seem like he had wanted much to do. Oh, yeah. Pilate, in terms of what I've read and what history can be dug up of him, and there's not actually a great deal, um, he didn't really care too much for 
needing or having to be in Jerusalem or being in Israel. He'd just, he'd rather, you know, be the Italian Roman person that he is and not have to bother with politics. That's just what I can find. He just didn't really care to do what he was doing, it seems. Mm -hmm. But, uh, isn't it ironic? ironic I it's not the right word. Um, verse two, the, they were laying out some of their accusations in front of Pilate, mm -hmm. one of which is forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, mm -hmm. and which is exactly the opposite mm -hmm. yeah. of, what he said, yeah. of what he said in Luke 20, right. verses 20 through 26, wherein he says to paraphrase choose who your master is you know are you going to declare Caesar to be your master are you going to declare God to be your master mm -hmm. render under Caesar that which is Caesar right render under God that which is God yep. he's saying who do you belong to mm -hmm. well right here they are admitting we belong to Caesar mm -hmm. yeah they they got it all mixed up. Yeah, they, they didn't even have to hide how mixed up they were because they, you know, as we know, they were purchased about a hundred, well, by this point, a couple of hundred years before, and the Sanhedrin anyway, the, the priesthood, and they were just, well, you know, you can tell when somebody's bought out, when they're purchased, when they're sold out as we, as we would otherwise say. So my simple heading here is the shuffle continues. And in brackets, I have oi to politics. <laughs> but um, quote unquote, the whole Sanhedrin is literally the whole multitude. However, we know this multitude to be the Sanhedrin from chapter 22, verse 66. And again, the Sanhedrin was run and operated by the Tzadokim or the Sadducees. Torah teachers or scribes were also involved in the operations of the Sanhedrin, and Pirashim, or Pharisees, were known to have led the priesthood in this recorded direction, according to John chapter 18, verse 3. You won't read of the Pharisees in any of this aside from that verse, but that verse does tell us that the Pharisees, you know, probably some of the leading Pharisees came up to the priesthood and said, hey, uh, you know, we're going to hand the situation over to you because he's really, he really doesn't like you. Even within the flow here of Luke 23, we see this shuffle touching upon all parts of humanity, though with a small location, within a small location. This has a divine purpose for all of mankind is directly affected by the Passover Lamb of God. This chapter shows that plan opening and broadening I do not usually point out the common word kai, but this, but with this continuing scene, this each each one of these little scenes opens with kai because it's linking all of this together. With this continuing scene, I must, as it continues, to affect us all, even to this very day. This is all linking together because, as Luke is trying to point out, this was purposeful as far as the Messiah, as far as God's concerned. He's accomplishing this for a grand purpose, to purchase all of mankind. Bringing Yeshua to Pilate, the story against Yeshua must be altered for said governor. Calling Yeshua a Messiah wannabe will not affect Pilate. So claiming that Yeshua forbid paying taxes to the Roman government and claiming to be a quote-unquote king might very well get Pilate's attention. Even so, a quote-unquote king of the Jews is of little concern to Pilate, who certainly wasn't willing to be swayed by anything quote-unquote Jewish. So the governor asked that question, for he clearly lacked interest in this particular fuss. Again, the response of the words are yours, and such replies are common from Adonai Yeshua at this point for reasons I trust are obvious. Mm -hmm. But Pilate here, here's an opportunity to ship this annoyance to Herod. <laughs> of course, we know that's Herod Agrippa, who just happened to be in town at such a time as this. 
So any other comments or thoughts concerning? I'm kind of repeating a theme, but. Okay. You know the theme. Basically, when you see a trail of politics happening, I ask anyway, okay, what's the backstory? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, you can see the, the broadcast, the broadcasted stuff, this trail of political actions and stuff, but what's the backstory? Well, what, what's the underneath toe? And with this, uh, there's a God saying, hey, um, I'm going to purchase all of mankind. I'm going to free all of mankind from sin, you know, suggesting that they actually follow me. But uh, this wayward purchased priesthood, I'm going to use them because they're already being used anyway. Well, I'm just really a nice guy, aren't I? Mm -hmm. Okay. Luke chapter 23, verses 8 through 12. We're just moving right along. Can I do it? If you don't mind. Herod was delighted to see Yeshua because he had heard about him and for a long time had been waiting to meet him. Indeed, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He questioned him at great length, but Yeshua made no reply. However, the head Kohanim and the Torah teachers stood there, vehemently pressing their case against him. Herod and his soldiers treated Yeshua with contempt and made fun of him. Then, dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Previously, they had been enemies. Okay. And you, of course, know that making fun of him is a can be either a light form depending on how heavy you do it a stronger form of that one word pronounced blasphemy okay hoping for a magic trick this is to me when i see king herod especially in the trial scenes this is what i see hoping for a magic trick while otherwise following the mob there's not a great deal here that is different aside from Herod's anticipation of seeing Yeshua because, quote, he hoped to see him perform some miracle, end of quote. So many times I have seen Adonai do wonders or miracles. It's translated as wonders in the Old Testament, miracles in the New Testament, because miracles is a nice Greek word that means wonders. I have seen and reported him opening and closing doors that no other person could affect. There are so many matters which we could elaborate on here. However, there is quite a difference between a magic trick and God's wisdom and sovereignty. I have no problem seeing Herod Agrippa here as hoping for something to dazzle him. Shucks, if Mr. Agrippa were here today, he might rush to put Yeshua on a stage with tunage to introduce him. <laughs> Now, I'm not trying to make fun. I'm just saying that, and, and, you know, the Holy Spirit can lead us to do a lot of wonderful flashy things as well, okay? Flashy things that stir our emotions. I'm not against that. I am not against that. Um, that is good. Uh, I am not merely male, but I have some emotions too. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit can also do things that we would not count as miracles. But when you can find no other explanation, what do you, what on earth do you think it is? A wonder is something that makes you, a wonder or a miracle is something that makes you go, wow, that was unique. And sometimes it just happens with God's wisdom. And it's not necessarily blood stirring. It's not necessarily something that causes you to laugh, cry, or shed a tear, or do something emotional. But it may be yet still yet a miracle. It may actually be the Holy Spirit working in a very strong way. And so here, I'm picking on King Herod because he would fit in well today with folks who just want to see a magic trick and call it a miracle from God. Again, I'm not against stirring your emotions. I'm against, I want to make sure we follow God's Spirit, test every spirit, every spirit. Herod didn't know how to test spirits. He just wanted to see something that would stir him up. 
Carrying on in my notes. Otherwise, Herod follows the mob with the same stuff the mob has been doing. Agrippa was born into a family of both Roman and Jewish influence, not all unlike modern American Christianity. In time, however, it became easy enough to just go along. After all, the strength of the mob, or our traditions, will always outweigh the Holy Bible, practically speaking. We would never say that, of course. Mm -hmm. This also allows Herod and Pilate to form practical ties, whereas they were previously enemies. Does anything here look even vaguely familiar? When you, when you come into a mob mindset and practically speaking, your traditions, you know, grandpa and grandma followed their grandpa and grandma who followed their grandpa and grandma. And we don't know where all that started, but grandpa, what grandpa and grandma followed is important here. Well, whatever the Bible says, that's fine. But what they said and did, okay, that leads us more and more for everybody else in the broader spectrum of the mob, be they people who may otherwise hate us. But when it comes to sticking together as a mob, by our traditions that forms us together does it not so the Herod section to me speaks of just that that kind of thinly veiled emotional yearning and need to be part of a mob who believes in magic tricks and nothing deeper or more solid two feet on the ground than that and that is, to me, a dangerous place. Any thoughts further while I'm being kind of mean? I've got a thought and I'm ruining it right now. I'm trying to think of a polite way to... <laughs> and I, and to I, I will also qualified by saying I'm um, certainly is always open to being corrected. But how many people who identify themselves as Christian say they are Christian and say they follow Jesus because, and this is American Christianity in particular, uh, and you're Western, I should say, kind of for the same reasons, because, oh, if you believe in Jesus, you go to heaven. They're in it for the reward. They're in it for the prize. They're in it for the magic trick. Mm -hmm. and it's rise from the dead. Instead of following Jesus because he's Jesus. The whole eternity, salvation, heaven, all that sort of stuff, that's icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. That's not the cake. Right. That's, that's besides the point. Uh, the point is Jesus is God. Jesus is salvation. Jesus is, you know, what was promised from the beginning and for that reason alone, whether we go to heaven or not, he's still Jesus and he still is worthy of, of being honored and, and glorified and respected for that alone. Mm -hmm. Even if we all go to hell. Mm -hmm. Doesn't change who he is, doesn't change who God is. Right. The fact that Jesus is dying for us so that we can be forgiven, dying for our sins, you know, that's above and beyond. That's nothing we have a right to expect. But so many Christians, well, if I do this, then I get that. I get this reward. <clears throat> I don't know how different that really is from, you know, if I buy my ticket and go see the magician do the magic tricks, I get, you know, it, it, it cheapens it, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, and that's basically what I'm seeing in, Particularly the the Herod scene, but um, maybe I'm wrong. Well, I I mean, I'm being too harsh. I'm I'm preaching it. You're you're just voicing a voicing it in a, a, a similar way. I, I 
was I going to say? I was talking to a friend this afternoon and explaining that the word translated narrow in Hebrew, and I don't, you know, we'll say, well, the New Testament was written in Greek. I don't care if it was written in Bangladesh. It was written by Jews. <laughs> but I don't think you can write in Bangladesh. Anyway. Well, well, you're there. You can go there. It's against the law to write in Bangladesh. <laughs> in the Jewish mindset, in Hebrew, narrow and um, trouble are the same word. Narrow is, um, oh, good grief, now my brain won't go there. The way. <laughs> Narrow is... There's a straight and a straight. Yeah. Narrow That's is the masculine way, the masculine form of a, of a particular Hebrew word, and, um, and, and uh, trouble is the feminine spelling of that same Hebrew word. Well, that makes sense. Well, right, yes. Yeah. But it's kind of like man, and then whoa, <laughs> whoa is man. Sorry. <laughs> so what we're saying here, you, even if I'm just talking to Brian, what, <laughs> she she totally missed that. Uh -huh, right, exactly. So what we're saying here is, our Lord says, walk the narrow path, walk the narrow way, which is it's going to have some trouble. You're going to, it's not always going to be comfortable. Uh, Following the Messiah within a world where demons fall, angels fall. Okay, this is this is the realm where demons dwell, right? They, they fall from heaven. Where, where do you think they fall to? So, walking, following the Messiah where demons dwell is not going to be easy. Okay, it's going to be at least uncomfortable, at the at the very least. So, you know, talking about that and the word straight, we're talking about. You know, going straight and, and, you know, right and left and all of these different kind of terms within the Bible that shows that anything other than straight following the Lord is this enigmatic place that doesn't have a place. It's just, you know, I said wandering earlier because wandering doesn't have a place. Otherwise, it wouldn't be wandering. So, yeah, you're going to have trouble being sane. You're going to have trouble being right. You're going to have trouble having two feet on the ground, but it's so much better than being insane. It's so much better than not knowing where on earth you are. It's so much better <laughs> than being caught up. I mean, you know, my spouse and I have been re-watching in 1992, I think, a set of programs called The Good Place, and you find out within that... They're not that old. Yeah, they're, it's pretty they're fairly recent. recent. Fairly recent, okay. Yeah. Uh, somewhere down the line, you know, chapter 13 or 14, you find out the good place is actually the bad place, i.e. heaven is actually hell. Spoiler. And, uh, <laughs> spoiler spoiler alert. alert. So, yeah. They, but the reason why, as, as is explained in that particular episode, is the fellow who made that place said, well, why have demons torture people when we can make them torture each other? You know? Well, yeah, there's the... I'm pretty sure there's this school, you know, I, well, I don't know how many people seriously believe it, but there's the idea, it's like, no, no, the, you know, it's, it's all already happened and this is hell. You know, it's like, we're already, we're all in hell. <laughs> in the Bible, hell is both here and the here and now as well as down below, so to speak. So, I mean, well, anyway, hmm. read the Gospels, it'll, it'll tell you that. Okay, so another, I think we pretty much hammered this pretty hard, but, uh, you know, be real. It's really all we're saying in this particular section on Herod and how he's looking for something to, you know, get his jollies. You know, be real. That's all we're saying. Sir Brian, could I ask you to read? Of course I'm, I'm asking you now. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> Luke chapter 23, verses 13 through 25. You get the longer stuff. Pilate summoned the head Kohanim, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought this man before me on charge of hurting the people. I examined him in your presence and did not find the man guilty of the crime you are accusing him of. And neither did Herod, because he sent him back to us. <laughs> 
<clears throat> Clearly, he has not done anything that merits the death penalty. <clears throat> Therefore, what I will do is have him flogged and release him. But with one voice they shouted, Away with this man, give us Bar Abba. He was a man who had been thrown in prison for causing a riot in the city and for murder. Pilate appealed to them again because he wanted to release Yeshua. But they yelled, Put him to death on the stake. Put him to death on the stake. A third time he asked them. But what has this man done wrong? I haven't found any reason to put him to death. So I'm going to have him flogged and set free. But they went on yelling insistently, demanding that he be executed on the stake. And their shouting prevailed. Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown in prison for insurrection and murder, the one they had asked for, and Yeshua, he surrendered to their will. Okay. This section is another one of those sections that, I mean, this whole chapter has just got some interesting points. This is a comparison with, quote-unquote, the son of the father versus son of the father. Um, but before I go, any any uh, thoughts about this? I'm, I'm about to share mine. I'm I don't mean to run over you. If you have something burning inside, or you just want to share. If you have something burning inside, yeah, yeah. get them on antibiotics. <laughs> get that get that checked out. <laughs> I know. Yeah, right away. Mm -hmm. like, you know, if you're feeling any warm feelings in your heart, you know that's sweet. that's just heartburn. Yeah, yeah. That's a, not a good sign. <laughs> Well, it's not radiating down your heart. Yeah. <laughs> Point. It's okay. So no, no productive thoughts. <laughs> Do you really want us to talk? <laughs> if we have thoughts, just maybe. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> so who am I preaching to? Here? Yes. I'm being. <laughs> well, let's see. Cody and Bit. <laughs> Whoever's watching. Uh -huh. All right, um, my thoughts are these. And again, I find this interesting, but two governing officials have found nothing in Yeshua worth their time. With this, Pilate intends to release him, and just as Kepha denied Yeshua as well as his follow, fellow Tamadim three times, so also leading Kohanim screamed for Yeshua's crucifixion three times. But before all of this, a question is raised and a quick time of decision is brought about. This decision has to do with two men, one with a claim of being son of God and the other who is named son of father, bar, son, abba, father. Yeah, it seems like, you know, he, that, the hizzle thing never gets brought up, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's never ne necessarily real. Well, because we, I think maybe because we Latinize, you know, Bar Barabbas. I mean, but, either way, it's, I, at least I never hear about him. Yeah, you don't hear about him so much. Yeah. So one is alleged to be righteous and subversive, riotous, and pardon me. One is alleged mm -hmm. to be riotous and subversive, the other having been in prison for rioting and murder. <laughs> you know the rest of the story. All of the politics involved to bring matters to this point leads me not to miss the point. Two men are recognized by, by the same personification. One is sort of being tried for the other, for what the other has served prison time for. One is the real, the other is the falsehood. At the end of the paragraph, the murderous son of father, by name only, is released while the other in whom is found no fault, who has demonstrated himself to be the Messiah, the son of the living God, is sort of sentenced to death. I say sort of sentenced to death. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, this kangaroo court thing is... Anyway. So, well, it, well, I mean, hardly sounds like there was a proper sentencing. He's yeah, just like, I mean, fine, do what you want. Right. <laughs> that was Yerushalayim just short of 2,000 years ago. This is today, and the issue is worldwide. To the Jew and the non, not so Jewish, may we portray the correct son of the father 
know the differences between the real and the lie. That's, that's what I typed then, and I think I feel the same now as this, this is presenting two sons of the Father, and the one let go is the one that was in prison, already having been convicted, and the one being sentenced hasn't really been convicted of anything. Still sounds like today. Yeah, it's still... Releasing criminals and putting people who won't wear masks, you know, right. finding them. Yeah. So, find the innocent. again, I find a difference between the real and the fake. Please be real. And I'm not, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir as far as folks in front of me, but um, goodness, if there's ever a time that we need to be real, you know, live in this, you know, instead of what the fellow call it, the, uh, the cartoon world, let's uh, get both feet on the actual real ground and recognize when, <laughs> when, when somebody would like to pull the wool over our eyes. But here, the wool is being pulled over the eye. It's just, well, I mean, yes, for a larger reason, for a grand purpose, but I don't think that re relieves anybody who's been completely blinded. Any thoughts further? Any further thoughts? Democracy in action. <laughs> Peer pressure in action, too. Yeah. The will of the people. 51% mm -hmm. can vote to 49% mm -hmm. oblivion. Mm -hmm. And what's that lovely little phrase? The moral majority is neither. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, just a little bit further. Um, yeah, next week we'll get in eventually to a a topic that I anticipate finding a fair amount of conversation about. But... Unlike tonight. Unlike tonight. <laughs> no. It's been a good night. Luke 23, 26-31, and I'll read it. 26-31, Ron reads like this. As the Roman soldiers led Yeshua away, they grabbed hold of a man from Cyrene named Shimon or Simon, if you like, who was on his way in from that country. They put the execution stake on his back and made him carry it behind Yeshua. Large numbers of people followed, including women crying and wailing over him. Yeshua turned to them and said, quote, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves and your children, for the time is coming when people will say, The childish Women are the lucky ones, those whose wombs have never borne a child, whose breasts have never nursed a baby. Then, quote, they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. And I say, quote, because he's quoting Hosea. Uh, I said I would read through 31, okay. For they do these, for if they do these things when the wood is green, what is going to happen when it's dry? So any thoughts concerning this passage? Heavy passages, I, I mean, you know, many sermons have been preached on these. Okay. All right. But, uh, we know further along mm -hmm. that uh, one would imagine that his mother was among these women here too. Mm -hmm. And of course we just celebrated the birth of Jesus, setting aside whatever mm -hmm. the actual date may have been. Not that important. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the most popular songs is of course Mary Did You Know? And didn't know everything, but when you read her prayer upon hearing, you know, the promise of talking to the angel, she knew a lot more than the head coding did. Mm -hmm. She knew a lot more than we tend to give her credit for. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure Joseph kind of knew what was up to, especially after many kids did. Mm -hmm. But when Jesus says, daughters of Jerusalem, 
don't cry for me. You kind of got to wonder or suspect that his mother was among those that were crying and wailing. Mm -hmm. And for the time is coming when young people say the childless women are the lucky ones. Well, if you think about his mother who had him and then several other siblings, kind of puts a little, a little bit new spin on that passage. Mm -hmm. Just a deeper layer of... Yeah. It makes it more real. Yeah. I mean, exactly. you know, because... Um, it's nice to say, well, you all, you know, 2,000 years ago, or, or you all over in that country or whatever, but when it affects your own family, you know, brings it home, as we say. Okay, um, my heading here is, quote, Israel was a luxuriant vine, dot, 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 quotation mark. Before I get to the real point of this paragraph, I have customarily liked to pick on Paul's lingo as recorded in Romans 16, verse 13, and the note of Mark 15, 21. A straight across translation of Romans 16, 13 has Paul saying, quote, Greet Rufus, the chosen in the Lord, and the mother of him and me. End of quote. In Mark 15, 21, Shimon of Cyrene, Shimon of Cyrene is referred to as, quote, the father of Alexander and Rufus, end of quote. I've never intended this as some conspiracy theory. It's simply too small for such. But the what-ifs cause my spirit to remember that Adonai will use whatever he wishes to draw someone to himself, by the interesting workings of the Holy Spirit. Might Paul use language of being crucified with the Messiah or of carrying his own cross or stake with a memory of his dad doing that very thing? I don't know, but it has sometimes, apparently now, piqued my interest. Now for the point. The King of Israel and Creator of the Universe quotes from Hosea, Hosea, chapter 10, verse 8. So we go to that full chapter for context. In fact, I'll just go there and read it. And then I'll talk about it in my notes. And then we'll conclude. Let me just go ahead and find Hosea. I'm sure you all don't mind, right? Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hosea, can you see? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Funny guy. <laughs> yeah. If I were for a minute, you could call me. <laughs> we're on a roll. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like butter. We like the butter too. <clears throat> Hosea okay. chapter 10 reads like this Israel was a luxuriant vine, <clears throat> freely putting forth fruit. As his fruit increased, he increased his altars. As, he, as his land got better, he improved his standing stones. The heart is divided. Now they, they will bear their guilt. He will break down their altars and destroy their standing stones, for now they will say, we have no king because we didn't fear Adonai. And what could a king do for us anyway? They mouth words, swearing falsely, making treaties. Thus judgment spreads like poisonous weeds in the furrows of a field. The inhabitants of Shomron are frightened of the <coughs> calf gods of Beit Avin. Shomron, by the way, the, by the way, Shomron or Samaria today is what we call uh, the, what is it? Um, oh, it's the big... Every time you hear of Israel and you hear of this particular northern West Bank, that's, the Bible calls that Samaria. Okay, so anyway, or Shomron. The inhabitants of the Shomron are frightened of the calf gods of Beit Avin. Its people mourn over it. Its priests tremble over it. 
over its glory, which has left it, it will be carried to Ashir, Ashir is Assyria, as a present for a warring king. Ephraim will be put to shame, and Israel be ashamed of his own advice. Shamron's king will perish like foam on the surface of water. Destruction will come to the high places of Avin, that is, the sin of Israel. Thorns and thistles will grow over their altars, and they will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Since the days of Givah they have sinned, Israel. Since the days of Givah you have sinned, Israel. There, there they have, they took their stand. For these arrogant people of Givah, war, war was insufficient punishment. When I wish to, I will discipline them, and the peoples will gather against them to discipline them for their two crimes. Ephraim is a well-taught cow. It loves to tread the grain, and I have spared her fair neck. But I will put Ephraim in, in harness. Yehuda will have to plow. Yaakov will uh, harrow his own land. If you sow righteousness for yourselves, you will reap according to grace. Break up unused ground for yourselves because it is time to seek Adonai till he comes and rains down righteousness upon you. You have plowed wickedness, reaped iniquity, and eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way, in your large numbers of warriors. Turmoil will erupt among your peoples and your fortresses will be destroyed just as Solomon destroyed Beit Arbel on the day of battle when mothers were dashed to pieces right along with their children, thus will be done to you, Bethel, or Bethel, because of your great wickedness at dawn the king of Israel will be completely cut off. Well, that's Hosea chapter 10, which is quoted from this passage. So my comment on this, the glory of Israel was once due to the glory of his God and king. Even within the context of the Gospels, our Savior either mourns over Jerusalem specifically or Israel in general. Within the context of Luke 22 and 23, one might lay out a downhill course of one corruption after another until we have gotten to this point of blessing those who have never given birth to children. Children who would then have to go through destruction brought on by decades and centuries of preferring sleep over prayerful attentiveness against temptation to slide down a muddy, highly slippery slope. But let's not slide things over to authorities we don't even know very well about and allow things to quickly dry up. Or let's just slide things over to authorities we don't even know very well about and allow things to dry up. You see, and I'm not sure you do, in these current and last days, we see that that same Israel being the ones who are shining brighter and brighter as we approach not even three quarters of a century. Okay, we're not even in three quarters of a century since 1948. that are shining brighter and brighter. All of this while the church struggles with something along the lines of identity, while, while wallowing in crippling phobias wallowing in crippling phobias and we're trying to find out who we are. May we begin with prayerful attentiveness against temptation. This is a good and decent beginning and then may we actually grow. For right now, the wood seems rather green still yet. May we allow no more rot. May we not allow any more rot to take place to this otherwise nice green wood that we call Western Christianity. Because right now, Israel, which there's a revival going on in Israel, in Israel, but not every Israeli by long shot, long shot is following our Savior. But there is a great revival and a lot of people are turning to him. It doesn't get reported, of course not. But it's happening. While Western Christianity is struggling with who on earth are we? You know, we're, we're, we're singing a great number of songs about identity because we're struggling with who on earth we are. Let's not allow this good green tree to rot. Okay. Any other thoughts concerning? 
<laughs> on that wonderful note. Mm -hmm. um, looking into 2021, I guess you know, my wife and I were talking about this earlier today. What do we look forward to in this next year? And I, I said, because this is just kind of where I find myself a lot nowadays is there's just been so much thrown up in the air, particularly in 2020 that, you know, what can I say? I, I don't know what's going to happen in the next hour, you know, let alone tomorrow and so forth, because it's just all thrown up in the air. But if I gather from scripture and what's generally spoken of here, you know, seeing a nice green tree that became rotted, I can see that same thing happening in Western, particularly American Christianity, where we're struggling to find out who we are, struggling to not be so absorbed into, you know, the rest of America that, you know, lest we find ourselves even siding with the rioters. And I guess what I'm finding tonight in terms of what's being spoken of, in terms of being real rather than cartoon world, so on and so forth, is let's find the life in that green tree rather than the rot that is trying to take us over, seemingly at least. May we follow life. Okay, any other thoughts? I'm, I don't want to ramble. I am thoughtless tonight. <clears throat> That's okay. I have no thoughts. That's all right. Might have it something to do with cats, <laughs> but um, but that would require, but determining the true cause would require thought. Yes. Well, cats that kept you up much of the night because they don't like each other. And they pee on. They're going through. A, they soak my covers. Going through a spell of claiming their ground in interesting yes. ways. We need to pray for peace amongst the cats. <laughs> yes. Peace amongst the cats and for them to go to the bathroom where they're supposed to. Not on no, that's a hard ask. Yeah. <laughs> that is. Yeah. A big one. All right. Well, upon sharing that critical piece of information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I, I get it. <clears throat> well, Father, as we close this particular part of this evening and thank you for thank you for a good night with just a very few understanding the time of year and so forth um, thank you for Shabbat thank you for the Sabbath and as we try to gain something from this these passages for the right here and now help us to just be real Help us to, to search out the real and search out real life and not bow to a cartoon version of life. Keep us real. Thank you, Lord. Hashem Yeshua in Jesus' name. Amen.